All right. So welcome again to everyone. Welcome to all the panelists tonight. Uh, I am Sarah Perry. I am just taking a back seat on this one this, this quarter. Um, but we are thrilled to have a great extensive panel here tonight of speakers from a lot of different backgrounds. So I wanted to introduce um, them in just a second and just the general format of the webinar to get started. So in general, um, we will use the Q&A. You can also use the chat, but it's easiest for us to keep track of things if you use the Q&A to enter your questions throughout the, the event. And we will answer questions after each speaker briefly, and then we'll spend the rest of the time um, in Q&A as long as it takes, um, as long as people have questions. So just to give you a little bit of um, an idea of what to expect afterwards, we are recording this and we will share that on the SIOP YouTube channel and send that link out to everyone who registered after probably sometime this week, you'll get that. So these are the panelists for tonight. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. So we're gonna start with Dr. Renata Wilson. She is with the United States Postal Service. And then after we hear from her briefly, we'll hear from Dr. Ludmila Preslova at the Vanguard University of Southern California. And she has an, more of an academic perspective, but also has some practitioner things to say. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Wessel from the University of Maryland and Dr. Courtney Bryant from Ford Motor Company. Um, and these two have worked together. I believe they're collaborators, co-authors um, have worked together. So I think they're kind of tag teaming some of what they're going to say, but they're going to talk or right after each other. And then Dr. Ashley Bamberg from Lumen Technologies. And then, as I said, we'll open it up for questions and we'll just continue with those until hopefully all of your questions will be answered. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop my share here and um, I will give the floor to Renee. Dr. Wilson, do you want to, if you have anything to share on your slides, you can do that. And we'll hear from Renee. So it says the host has disabled participants. Oh, I'm here. sorry, let me. Let me see what I can do here. How do I enable? Here we go. There you go. And I'll fix that for everyone else while we're doing that in the background. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so like Sarah mentioned, I'm Renata Wilson and I work at the United States Postal Service. I'm located in Washington, D.C. at headquarters. Um, so I'll give you guys a little background on myself before I talk about the DEI portion. Ooh, sorry, I got two screens. Um, so I have my doctorate in IO psychology from the University of Houston. Actually, Sarah is um, one of my classmates, not the same cohort. Um, I've spent the majority of my career in the government space, and that can include municipal government, state government. Even when I worked externally, it was mostly with federal contracts. So um, most of my experience is dealing with uh, government entities. And so um, on the left side of the slide, I have like a brief summary of my previous roles without telling you where. You can go on LinkedIn for that. It's all there. Um, <laughs> my most recent role is the manager of test development and validation at the Postal Service. Um, previously, I was a personnel psychologist here. And then I was a senior consultant externally for a couple years and then spent four years working in a state government organization. It was a healthcare organization and then began my career at the city of Houston um, doing special projects after I did an internship there. So just to give you a sense of kind of what my role is right now. So I manage a team, it's a small but mighty team of IO psychologists, and we manage all the assessments for the Postal Service. So that includes testing, that includes interview, um, creating like interview guides, interview questions, 
um, surveys, any sort of multi-rater feedback like 360s, any sort of surveys that we create in order to evaluate the effectiveness of programs, um, also any sort of assessments that we use to um, measure leader readiness or um, areas of strength and opportunity for leaders to get development. So we focus on the assessment side and then we have partners within our department of OD that will focus on the actual activities of development, but we help them by providing that sort of assessment so that they can see what sort of training or leader development that they need. Okay. So I have three slides. This is my last slide. <laughs> so when I was thinking about this topic, I felt like there were two places or two ways that I impact diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the first part is as a practitioner. So obviously in my role as the manager of test development and validation, um, the way that I impact diversity, equity, and inclusion is making sure that the assessments that we use are job related and validated, um, doing um, adverse impact, making sure that they're fair in terms of are there other ways to measure this that doesn't include as much adverse impact but give us the same results and the same level of qualified candidates? Um, also providing co consultation to operations or the business about what types of assessments they should use or qualifications on the job description. Taking a look at it and saying, hmm, this is something that has a lot of adverse impact. Are there other ways that we want to look at this? Or is this really key to performance? So we just need to be aware of this is one of the possible consequences and that we're willing to take on that risk and or um, that we're willing to make that decision in terms of our applicant pool. Um, also in terms of defining performance, um, just making sure that we're evaluating and defining performance in an objective way, that we're focusing on criteria that's measurable and Although that's a little more indirect, I do also feel that's a way of promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion because we're focusing on something that can be subjective, but trying to add, which is my last bullet, trying to add as much objectivity in the terms of evaluation, um, evaluating performance, evaluating candidates, um, just all of those aspects where subjectivity really plays a role in um, making some of these job decisions or uh, decisions as far as HR is concerned. And then the other side is as a manager and an employee. So just from a personal aspect of thinking about what's important to me in terms of being at work, um, being authentic, being my full self at work, I feel impacts diversity and inclusion because the more behaviors that people see, the more ways that people present themselves at work but are still successful, are still able to complete their job and be high performing, I think opens the door for there to be many ways for others to present themselves at work. And I feel like that really impacts inclusion because a lot of times the difference in what we see as professional or non-professional is really value-based and or um, based on the culture of the organization. And if the culture is pretty homogenous, that's going to impact what we think is okay. So focusing on authenticity, thinking about inclusion in terms of what types of behaviors are uh, available, and then thinking about what's the actual outcome of what we're trying to do. And does this thing that we're focusing on actually impact that outcome, or is it just a preference? Just um, really trying to examine what the status quo is and making sure that the decisions that we're making either about selecting people or whether or not someone met their goals is based on actual outcomes based on criteria that was defined pre, um, before the evaluation and thinking about um, how do we provide a space where individuals feel like they can show up as themselves at work because that's when we're most engaged and we're most, you know, where our performance is our best. 
and um, allowing for those different perspectives, because as we can see in this era that we're in right now, that's how we uh, maintain continuity on, in the business. That's how we maintain innovation. That's how we're able as organizations to deal with the sort of um, challenging environment is by making sure that we don't have a group of people who all think the same and come up with the same solutions and the same um, sorts of problem solving activities to address what's going on. And one way to do that is to make sure when we're focusing on behaviors, especially when we're talking about selecting people, that we're not selecting people out because they don't necessarily fit the mold of what I think someone should be in terms of the role. If they meet all the qualifications, let's just have a conversation about whether or not what we're focusing on is actually impactful. It may be. You may have the conversation and find out, well, actually this really doesn't fit, but just have the conversation. And I feel like that's how as an individual, as a manager, and also as an employee in the organization that by interjecting in those conversations and asking questions and asking people playing, I guess, devil's advocate, let's think about this. Let's have a conversation about what's happening and that will impact it from the perspective of me not being an IO psychologist, but just being an employee in the organization. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to the next individual. Well, actually you said question and answer for a little bit. Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me we do have a myself. couple of questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Renee. That I just love how you connect everything so well and, um, just really, you do a great job of bringing it back to the criterion, which is one of the big things we talk about in IO and what is important, what are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to measure? So great questions. Um, so we have a couple of questions here in the Q&A. One is, do you feel that requiring a specific field when hiring is a potential way to uphold the status quo? Can this impact diversity in terms of ageism, et cetera? Any thoughts on that one? So I think, so when they have a number of years in the field, there's supposed to be a correlation with this many years of experience. You should have had these levels or these types of experiences. So I'm not sure if it's upholding the status quo to a certain extent, but as a human resources professional, if I'm talking to a hiring manager that wants to put a years of experience on their job description as part of the way to screen out employees, I'll have a conversation with them. Okay, you say you want five years, what's the minimum? What are you expecting to come with this five years? Are there other ways to define this? Are there knowledge, skills, and abilities that you're looking for that you think you are measuring through the years of experience? In some instances, years of experience is important and we can't negate that, but when we're using years of experience as a proxy for something else, let's find out what that something else is and is there a better way to measure it than just years of experience? Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna take one more here and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And then we'll definitely keep all these questions up so we can answer them in the, in the long Q&A, but I don't wanna put Renee on the spot too much either. <laughs> All right. The next question is, you have a unique perspective working for a governmental organization. What do you find motivates leaders to want to be better DEIA allies, where I am coming from, given that DEIA directly benefits the bottom line, innovation, and efficiencies? When you're in an organization that has things, what can you do to encourage people to want to be better? So... And this is just my perspective. This is not necessarily supported by research. So, you know, the academics on here can you know, say what they feel. Um, it's more to me in terms of that, it's, it's not that they, I feel like it's not that they don't value it to a certain extent. I think a lot of people do give the lip service and they're well-meaning when they say that they care about these things. It's just that they don't know how to, um, 
enact them. They don't know how to bring them about in their business. And I think part of that is a little bit, and somebody might be upset with this. I think it's some part um, on the fault of um, kind of how we've uh, pushed diversity and inclusion in terms of organizations. I feel like we focused a lot on representativeness, which is important. That's like the first step. But there are other things that are important. And when you focus on the representation piece, I feel like people get lost. And focusing on Let's think about what are some of the things that we're looking for and that you're bringing to the table that you're um, looking for in employees. And then maybe having the conversation about those specific things um, can help drive that bottom line. But I think a lot of managers, when they just hear DEI, they're like, oh, okay, so what do they need to look like so that you can leave me alone? And that's really not what we're looking for. I feel like just from my experience being a person of color, working in large organizations, I think the inclusion part is what's needed. Having like a wider bandwidth or um, a wider range of behaviors so that people can kind of show up and act a little differently, but still get the same do job done and have that perspective that um, brings, you know, new ideas, um, asks good questions that other people haven't thought of. That's really what's going to hit the bottom line. Um, so I think it's kind of shifting the perspective from, okay, like we want every, we want it to look diverse as opposed to um, let's achieve both. We want representation, but we want representation for specific reasons. So let's talk about those specific reasons and think about how are we achieving that um, outside of, you know, I got these many women, so I'm good. Great, right, thanks so much. All right, so let's move on to Dr. Ludmilla Preslova. Uh, do you wanna go ahead and, well, Renee, you can stop sharing your screen unless I can. And then Ludmilla can do hers. All right. Absolutely. Okay, here goes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for invitation. And I don't know how the order actually was decided, but I will pick up on some of the things that Dr. Wilson was talking about because uh, when we're talking about inclusion of different kinds of behaviors and uh, different styles of thinking, that definitely overlaps with the problem that I'm trying to solve, which is neurodiversity and autism inclusion in the workplace. But uh, before I get to the problem I'm going to solve, Solve. I'm also going to talk a little bit about myself and how did I get to that point and uh, where do I fit in the whole picture, how industrial organizational psychology can help with diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So I know I've been cast as an academic here, and as Sarah mentioned, I am a little bit of everything. I've done quite a few things in my life. So uh, for the last 15 years, I have been with Vanguard University of Southern California, and I'm a professor and director in graduate program in organizational psychology. But uh, unless you already figure out by my accent, I was not born in California, I was born in Moscow. And uh, my first job was in global diversity. And that was a very, very long time ago. It was in early 90s. So my first job with, uh, was with international companies on um, the large cultural global level of making sure that people are able to communicate and work together and achieve organizational mission. So I've done that for about six years before I um, went on to really getting more of a formal uh, industrial organizational psychology doctorate. And during that time, I was um, always focused on culture something. 
my thesis, my dissertation, everything had something to do with culture and psychology, how culture influences our minds, our brains, our behavior. And there was just always something I was fascinated with. So I looked at culture on a variety of levels and multiple manifestations of national culture, uh, social economic, regional, uh, gender, and other uh, group level influences in our individual behavior than how we treat others. And uh, then for the last couple of years, I kind of went from the really global level to neurodiversity or mental wiring diversity and our brain diversity. And uh, I, I, I became really, really passionate about the autism employment paradox, which I will talk about a little bit later. But as you can see, I was also feeling a little bit artistic this morning. And um, uh, I was just trying to think about, okay, so what it is that I'm doing in my life? And basically, I've been a practitioner and uh, I've been an academic. And I'm very well aware that there's actually a bit of a cultural and communication gap. So uh, there's, there's practice and it's wonderful and there's science and it's wonderful and it's a beautiful landscape, but sometimes they need to work together and we need to bring uh, you know, discoveries from science to practice or acute questions from practice to science. And we don't actually have a wonderful communication line. And sometimes things kind of get lost in that sometimes arduous transition. So really the work that I've been most interested in is uh, bridging it. So we actually started a conference that specifically focuses on uh, bridging, bridging science and practice. And for my personal passion, I definitely focus on doing it specifically within the area of uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So I'm kind of trying to uh, really function as uh, a part of the bridge that I think is very much needed. And how do I do it specifically in my role? Well, in my more of the academic function, it's still not just academics uh, defined as research, it's also academics as teaching and training. So uh, when we designed our program, we very intentionally integrated uh, diversity and inclusion into everything we do. So we want to train practitioners who are also able to bring uh, inclusion perspective into everything they do. So uh, we have Master of Science in Organizational Psychology, Master of Arts in Organizational Psychology, but we also have a built-in uh, intercultural and inclusive leadership certificate so that our students are able to address some of those uh, core issues and uh, they hopefully will be the new influence in the workplace. And actually I know many of them are already doing this kind of work in the workplace. And it's, it's definitely a very rewarding part of what I do, trying to uh, kind of maximize the effect of uh, what we're able to do as far as bringing change. But uh, for myself, I've been doing some consulting, speaking, training when I can, um, either on my own or with a small group that I belong to. It's called uh, a focus leader. And uh, most recently, I actually had an opportunity to present to Amazon. I was actually a little surprised when they contacted me. Just thought, okay, is that a joke? Is that a spell? No, they actually wanted me to um, work with them and help them out. So. Uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, just those amazing opportunities can come our ways to influence even organizations that are very large who want to learn about different ways to work with uh, a variety of human diversity and uh, to bring in different aspects of humanity. So again, they wanted my specific expertise in uh, neurodiversity in the workplace. So in addition, 
uh, especially in the last couple of years, it was maybe kind of life stage and part of the pandemic, but I've been writing uh, a lot in the last couple of years. And some of it is academic. So right now I'm editing a special issue on disability inclusion for um, uh, consulting psychologist journal practices, research, practice and research. But I also think that it's very important to write directly for practitioners. So for the last year, I had a blog for uh, Shroff Society of Human Resources Management, where I mostly talk about uh, diversity and inclusion. And I recently started um, writing for uh, fast companies. So, uh, and, and there's a few other outlets like um, Airy TLNT. So I've been doing a few different things, trying to communicate, uh, maybe research and inform, empirically informed uh, ways to re-energize in some ways or bring a different uh, way of thinking about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. But all of this started with trying to solve specific problem that kind of hit me just about a couple of years ago. And uh, that problem is um, neurodiversity employment paradox and um, in particular autism employment paradox, but it also does apply to uh, issues that are faced by people who are dyslexic, who have a DHD, uh, dyspraxic, Tourette's syndrome. So that would be the cluster of neurodiversity. And use the word autistic because it's a self-preferred identification by adult autistic people. So uh, identity uh, first is a preferred version among the community. And um, there is a lot of demand on the one hand for autistic talent among some very large companies and governmental agencies and Israel military who has a special unit uh, that takes advantage of uh, a very fast and accurate visual processing that uh, a portion of autistic people exhibit. However, if you look at unemployment numbers, they are just absolutely horrendous. There's no other way I can put it. And uh, actually people who also have uh, co-occurring intellectual difficulties do better than those who don't because for college graduates, for autistic uh, individuals who don't have uh, intellectual disability, there are no programs and basically no help. So that's why uh, the numbers for autistic college graduates are actually um, higher as far as unemployment than for uh, those who are not college graduates. So there's, there's a lot of paradoxes within this big paradox. Uh, and uh, most autistic individuals are way overqualified, overskilled, overeducated for the kind of jobs they end up with. And uh, there's actually quite a bit of blatant prejudice that is expressed. And uh, according to a pretty recent UK study, 50% of the managers acknowledge that they do not want to hire and they do not want to uh, manage neurodivergent individuals. So there's a lot to think about. So on the one hand, people are talking about uh, talent, the lack of talent, we need talent, but there are segments of talent that nobody wants. And again, in many uh, ways, I believe our talent problem, problem right now is a diversity problem because we are ignoring some kinds of talent and we select some of the talent out. But specifically with um, neurodivergent populations, uh, the problem is usually addressed in two ways. So traditionally, there has been disability medical perspective where an individual needs to be fixed, but uh, the more community accepted uh, perspective and my perspective is that social and organizational uh, circumstances have a lot to do with those unemployment numbers. So when I started thinking about it, basically every area that we study in industrial organizational psychology explains why we have this unemployment paradox. So if you start thinking about 
uh, the very start of the talent process. Job descriptions are non-inclusive. People cut and paste. Uh, everybody wants, uh, you know, fast talking persons, sales person personality in a fast paced environment, even if the job has nothing to do with any of that. And uh, they use, you know, the team uh, player ninja kind of expressions that really, again, are not necessary, but they even preclude certain individuals from applying. And then of course we have um, selection procedures that very often over rely on interviews, over rely on personality impressions rather than measuring actual skills. So in many cases, selection lacks validity. And then if we manage to get over this hurdle, uh, then we have physical work environment, open offices uh, that don't work pretty much for most people, for anyone. And um, pandemic side sort of helped, but still, um, in many jobs, there's just unnecessary overstimulation that uh, prevents people who are, have sensory sensitivities from even coming near that kind of work environment. And again, it's completely unnecessary. Work organization, co-worker bias, uh, the need for different kinds of training, maybe deeper level psychological training for understanding how uh, different kinds of people function in the workplace and uh, lack of psychological safety. All of those things influence other people. It's not just autistic people, but because autistic people live in an intense world and tend to process things more intensely, it also influences us more intensely. Uh, the lack of transparency in organizations is especially a problem because figuring out hidden messages and, you know, uh, secret passages to promotion and so forth is also a major issue that also leads to the lack of representation and the lack of diversity in decision making, which starts the whole cycle over again. So really, whatever uh, your interest is within industrial organizational psychology, whether it's uh, selection validity or developing a psychological safety in organizations, all of those elements add up to prevent certain minority groups uh, from succeeding in the workplace. So all of them need to be addressed. And there's a lot that our research can say about that. But in trying to solve autism inclusion problem, I also started thinking about a yet larger problem in that regardless of which group we're focusing on, uh, whether it's women or first generation college students or any other group, veterans, uh, inclusion interventions very often fail and they don't last. Uh, many organizations have a revolving door of uh, people in diversity roles. It's stressful, people leave, uh, new people champion different causes. And uh, in general, very often uh, people become disillusioned because they started this intervention for women and then they didn't work and then they kind of abandoned it. And then they started doing something for disability and it didn't go anywhere. And then they uh, turned to veterans and then people really, really can become very cynical because of the lack of the success track record and success examples. So in trying to solve this larger problem, I really focused on the role of intersectionality and trying to address system of um, organizational health in a way that it would work for people who have three, four, five, six, seven, however many different um, underprivileged or underrepresented markers that each make it harder to get over each hurdle. Uh, how can we create organizations that work for all kinds of people? So first, I wrote my list of what you need to do to be autism-friendly employer. And then I just I de replaced autism with X. Basically, insert whatever group; it's still going to work the same. And this is just my article for sure. But uh, really, if you have valid selection systems, 
you don't necessarily have to create something for autistic people or people with disabilities or women, because if you have a more fair and valid selection system, they're much more likely to be selected because unfair barriers would be removed. You don't just need to uh, create workplace that works for autistic people. Autistic people need, flexi need flexibility. So do parents, so do caretakers with older relatives. So pretty much does every human being that has life. So creating flexible, transparent, psychologically safe environments really make organizations human friendly and talent friendly. And there are very special cases when you might still need individual level accommodations, but by creating better workplaces, really most individuals will actually not need any kind of specific accommodations when it uh, comes to people with um, invisible disabilities because what they really need is flexibility and fairness and that is something that most of us can use. So the latest thing I did that would be my uh, publication for a couple of weeks ago in uh, Fast Company, I'm talking about systemic inclusion uh, that should in, uh, cover three major points. It needs to be intersectional because otherwise we're designing something for women, but we're excluding, excluding women with disabilities, or we're deciding something for uh, first generation college students, but we forget all the different cultural aspects uh, that are characteristic of subgroups within this larger group. So we need to always remember intersectionality. Uh, our interventions need to be comprehensive, touching on every aspect of this entire system of talent management. And they also need to be embedded. And it's not just putting a ladder against a barrier. It's taking the barrier down uh, because ladders and ramps Someone else can come and take them away. Management changes and they don't like it or they don't want to spend money on diversity programs. Uh, they'll take away your special program. If you create an organization that is inclusive by design, you're much more likely to create a lasting intervention. So that is where my heart is. And uh, that's what I'm working on right now, trying to... Um, speak to different kinds of people who uh, might just want something simpler than uh, a very long system that has many moving parts. That's my way of trying to simplify without oversimplifying in trying to bridge uh, research and practice. And that's the end of my presentation and I'm very easy to find. Uh, here's my email, LinkedIn, I'm pretty, I have a pretty unique name, so I'm very easy to find. You can find my Sherm blog, but all of that is linked from my LinkedIn. That's, that's probably the quickest way. Thank you so much. I, um, I really appreciate this other, this more, because not only did you give us this picture of what a career can look like in IR psychology, another way a career can look, but also this uh, very interesting area of research. So thank you. So we have, I'll take one question here and then we'll save the other questions for after the other speakers go. Um, Abby asked, does personality tests or do personality tests have any process? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I'm, I missed some of that. Do personality tests have an impact on selection On this process, process or these dynamics, right? Yes. Well, again, there, there are the right and wrong ways to use personality tests. Unfortunately, some organizations decide that there is good personality. And for example, they decide that extroversion is a major part of good personality, regardless of specific role. Or uh, they even define it as uh, someone who, who just have give you good banter in the interview or measure it more formally with personality tests, but it's not valid for a specific role, uh, it definitely could be a problem. And uh, 
any kind of personality characteristic could be helpful and important and valid for particular roles, but not for others. I think organizations kind of use this instrument sometimes um, in ways that, that are not appropriate. So yes, if you rely on personality testing and just select this personality that's good for our company, you are going to end up with the same kind of people and uh, this forced culture fit. So it just needs to be validated and very specific to what you're selecting people for. And also as a previous speaker mentioned, just check your assumptions. Is that actually needed? Right, great, great points. All right, so let's bring up Dr. Wessel and Dr. Bryant, or however you all are going to work. This is up to you, so the floor is yours. Okay, let me just share my screen really quickly. Okay, and um, I have two screens, so I just want to check when I start it. Are you seeing the notes version or the regular version? Regular. Regular, so, so it's okay. Okay, <laughs> good, thanks. So uh, today, Courtney and I are going to be, be talking about bringing your whole self to work, building an inclusive and authentic workplace. And I'm really excited to be co-presenting. Um, we got to sort of think about this uh, chapter that we worked on together with our colleague, Sarah Barth, a while ago. So it's been fun to, to be able to do this together. Okay, so um, I want to just give a little background on each of us and, um, just about me, I, I um, received my PhD in organizational psychology from Michigan State University, and now I'm an associate professor in psychology at the University of Maryland. So in terms of career, um, my institution is pretty research heavy, so I'm doing a lot of research, but I also um, teach uh, three classes a year and um, at both the graduate and undergraduate levels, and then do service and um, other work, including DEI work at the university. Um, I, a lot of organizational psychologists who are academics, you know, as, as our other speakers have discussed, um, do consulting work. I've, I've done a little bit that's not my main focus. So on the practitioner side, other people are going to probably cover better than I do, but I, I'm, I can cover the research and the academic side a little um, uh, pretty well. Okay, so my expertise areas are diversity and inclusion and authenticity, and we're going to talk about both of those today. Courtney, do you want to chime in on your background? Sure. So I am currently getting my PhD at Michigan State. Uh, I defend my dissertation on December 9th, so woo, it's coming up. Um, but right now I am a diversity and inclusion associate at Ford Motor Company. Uh, I've been working at Ford for about two years now, and they have a, a ton of IO psychologists, actually. Um, mostly the people that work in the talent analytics group, but we also have people in many different areas. Um, I am in the diversity, equity, and inclusion group. Um, it's a global office for DEI, if you will. And I am like the metrics and measurement person of DEI. So how do we know that we're doing good? How do we know we're progressing? How can we know our return on investments on these programs that we have? Um, and also evaluating how people are feeling at the company. So how do we know how our people are experiencing inclusion and belonging. So um, a common title, <coughs> excuse me, is a people experience scientist. <coughs> okay, great. So I wanna start off talking a little bit about um, what authenticity is. So I first like to talk about what it's not. I'm seeing I'm having a graphics problem, but that's okay. So. When I tell people that I am uh, interested in authenticity, especially when I was first starting out and there was less research on that in our area, a common thing that people would say to me is, well, why, why would, you, would we want people to be authentic? Why do you want people saying, oh, I hate your new haircut or I don't like your outfit or whatever? And it was this common misconception, and it's because we also use it colloquially in politics as well, that being authentic means being rude or impolite and telling people, you know, terrible things. Um, when in fact, authenticity is not being rude or blunt or unfiltered. It's uh, the psychological def definition is about the expression of one's true felt self. So there's a great, I think it's going to be blocked here, but there's a great Frederick Douglass quote that really fits it that I'll just read then that says, I prefer 
um, to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and incur my own abhorrence. And that really gets at the psychological definition of authenticity. So it's the idea that you want to show others who you truly are. And so it's related to one of um, what social psychologists think are our core needs. So when we think about core needs, these are things that we think universally bind us together, things that people want that motivate them. So one of those would be belonging. You know, everybody wants to feel accepted. Maybe we differ in how many people we care about we belong with, but most of us want to belong. Uh, Self-enhancement, we want to feel competent. We want to feel good, at, good about ourselves, that we're significant, that we can contribute in some way. And then this up here at the top, self-verification, really fits in with authenticity. So this is the idea uh, that we are motivated to have others see us the way we see ourselves, which again is the crux of, of authenticity. What's important to think about though and to note is that when we're talking about the true self, the true self is not um, just one thing. Our selves are multifaceted uh, and exist at different levels. So we have the individual self, which is what makes us unique from other people. So being caring or extroverted or creative, um, these are all just examples. We have relational or role selves, so things that bind us to other people. So in our, you know, non-work life, that might be being a sister or a parent or something like that. But in our work life, our role identities might be our identity as a supervisor or coworker or mediator in some way. And then we have our collective identities that bind us to other groups. So that typically we think about demographics when we think about that. So our racial or ethnic identity, our religious identity, our gender identity, our sexual orientation identity, disability identity. Um, but there are also other collective identities that can be important to people that bind them to others that are group related, like um, a hobby or um, some sort of, or uh, like an alma mater, things like that. So in one study that I just want to talk to you about briefly uh, that I worked on with practitioners, so this was a nice joint project here um, at a large technology organization and also some other um, workers that we surveyed, so we had thousands of employees, we asked them to list their most important identity at each of these levels. So what's your most important individual identity, work-related identity, collective identity? And just to give you a sample of what that can look like, um, we had one participant these are real participants from the sample out of thousands, but we had one participant who said, okay, my most important identities are I'm an introvert, I'm a coworker, and I'm black. Somebody else said I'm nerdy, I'm a teacher, I'm liberal. Somebody else said I'm happy, I'm a supervisor, I'm a woman. So we see lots of different identities that are important to people. And then what we did is we asked them, okay, think about those identities and how authentic are you? So meaning, are you able to share the nerdy part of yourself at work? Um, do you feel like you're the type of supervisor that feels authentic? Are you able to reflect your racial or gender identity at work? And our findings, um, I'm just simplifying them here, but overall what we find is that each of them are uniquely predictive of worker well-being, job satisfaction, retention, intention. So you're likely um, the, the likelihood that you think you'll stay at your job. And so by uniquely predictive, what I mean is that each one of them are important. Um, and so that we should be thinking about the whole employee when we think about authenticity at work. And then another really interesting finding though, is that if you compare the three and how strongly they predict these outcomes, the most important in the workplace was relational. So for instance, can you be the type of supervisor that feels authentic to you? And our thought for why this might be is that individual identities, collective identities, they're both important to be authentic in the workplace. We think the reason that relational was more important is because you can only really be a supervisor at work. I guess you can try to go home and supervise people, but it's a little bit different. Um, but your personality, right, carries out of the workplace. Your collective identities exist in other spaces. And so if you are in a workplace where maybe you can't be as authentic in those areas, which is bad according to our data, um, but if you are in a workplace where you can't be as authentic at those levels, um, you at least have other outlets and other places where you could maybe enact that authenticity. So the takeaway is that all three are important, but particularly this relational level is important to employees. Um, and there's a lot of research to back up that authenticity is important, that people want to be themselves at work at all levels, all parts of their identities. But one thing that Courtney and I were, just, were uh, working on with our colleague Sarah is, but, but who gets to be authentic? 
So we know from past research that authenticity is easier when you have power, both formal, meaning your position in the workplace, but also informal, like how networked are you, how um, well mentored are you. Uh, it's easier to be authentic when who you are is already acceptable, meaning this, you know, sort of facade of fit that we all talk about, the status quo that Dr. Wilson discussed, this idea that you already fit in. Um, when uh, you feel you won't be punished for expressing your true self, so that's called psychological safety. And when you have relative freedom of expression, meaning you're in a sort of more autonomous workplace, all of these can affect how authentic someone thinks they can be in the workplace. Important for diversity, equity, inclusion to note is that when you are in the minority, if you're from a historically excluded group, um, and this cuts across a lot of different groups, you tend to have less power, both formal and informal in the workplace, and you tend to have lower feelings of fit um, because the status quo uh, was built around the majority. And so what does that mean? It means it's harder to be authentic. So what our chapter was that we worked on together that I'll just go over briefly was really getting at what are the barriers that minority employees, employees from historically excluded groups, um, what are the inauthentic experiences that they often have to endure in the workplace that hopefully we can come up with some solutions to, to um, combat? So one is this idea of having to constantly inauthentically manage your own identity. And these are not Inclusive. These are not all inclusive. I'm just giving some examples here to make it tangible. So I need to seem like one of the guys at work. So I need to constantly be thinking about, you know, how my gender, right, is being enacted here. I should use my English name so people don't feel uncomfortable. It's a common thing you hear people talk about. I shouldn't talk about being gay at work. Maybe they even know you're gay, but I shouldn't talk about it. Okay, so you're managing your identity. And all of those are, are inauthentic, right? You can also think about code switching, which a lot of people have been talking about lately, right? So, so these, these ways that you're inauthentically managing your identity. Also, we've seen that um, it can be harder to develop deep relationships. So then you're, um, when you are from a historically excluded group for several different reasons, which means your relationships are less authentic and more superficial. So this is where you might hear things like, no one at work knows the real me, or I can't put my guard down, or I can't be the type of leader that would come naturally to me. And then lastly, there's this idea of the lack of authentic voice. And this one's a big one. So I can't speak up because I'd rock the boat. Or if I say that I'm upset, I'll be labeled aggressive, which is a, a big one that you um, see particularly um, women of color talking about. So this idea that you can't you know, express regular normal felt emotions or you might be labeled aggressive. And all of these really um, can interact with one another I, I wanna make sure we get to the end though, because I, I think I'm running a little long here, but this is just to note that all of these interact with one another. So having a lack of voice can cause you to then more um, you know, authentically manage your identity um, and, and they all sort of can affect one another. Um, so this is where Courtney's gonna start and in, in, in I'm giving her the positive part. She gets to be the ray of sunshine of how do we build an authentic workplace for all. So uh, Courtney, you tell me when you want me to move along with, with um, and I'll move along the slides. Thanks, you can hit it. I think this okay. all gonna come up at the same time. Okay. Um, okay, so I think one thing that Dr. Steve Robbins, who is a person that's spoken many times at Ford likes to say, is the only person you can control is yourself. So I'm just starting off with yourself. What can you do? to build an authentic workplace. Um, you can start with asking yourself, what are my most important identities? So Jen was just talking about some of the different uh, types of identities, like your relational identities. Um, what are those for you? Like, what is it that would be important for you to be able to enact in your workplace? And then think about what are you not displaying? What are you actively managing? What are you holding back? Um, we all know that doing that kind of work can leave you feeling tired and anxious and unfulfilled. Um, my dissertation is very much related to that and I'm hearing a lot about that these days. And on the opposite end of that, what would being authentic actually look like then? So, you know, if you are not holding back and you're ex um, experiencing your most important identities, what does that look like for you? Um, very importantly, how do you allow other people to be their authentic selves? Is, is it at work a chance where you invite people to be personal with you, to express their identity, 
uh, work with them with the way that they approach you. Um, one of the examples I like to use are, um, do you bully introverts into conversations or do you allow them to be introverts? Because everybody, you know, belonging for everybody is not chatting for two hours. <clears throat> And then this one is bold, and I would I acknowledge that some people have more privilege to do this than others. So, um, you know, recognize the risk and rewards of your situation. But can you look at your workplace and say, "I'm going to do it anyway"? Uh, one of the things that I know my friends and I personally have done is we wear our natural hair how we want, despite knowing that we're going to get different reactions. I'm going to do it anyway because it's my hair, and that's what I want to do. All right, next slide. So at the organizational level, there's tons and tons of things you can do. And I think some of our previous panelists have hit on some of them. So Dr. Wilson was talking about hiring and performing criteria. Uh, when you're stepping back and evaluating those, are we creating barriers to authenticity? Um, I think Jen wrote a paper was that with Christine about should women man up in interviews? Is that something that you want to require people to do is to be more masculine because they have to be more agentic during an interview? Or can people just be who they are and be accepted that way? Um, how does your onboarding promote organizational identity? Is it at the expense of everybody's individual identity? So are you encouraging people to adopt um, this organizational fit, like they have to shave off pieces of themselves in order to fit. It's not what you want to do. Are there safe spaces for women and underrepresented minorities to feel most welcome and authentic? Oftentimes that tends to be our affinity groups, employee resource groups, um, safe spaces where they can just be alone and discuss their experiences. <clears throat> I love this one. Um, do we have diverse leadership? That should just be a bullet on its own, but <laughs> diverse leadership and then who model authenticity because you also see diverse leadership that is the same cookie cutter, which then sends the message that in order to be successful, you have to fit this specific mold. And do we support employees challenging their own biases? Um, <clears throat> I think this one goes with the last one as well as do we have a call in culture? So is this a learning organization where we are comfortable helping each other learn how to be better? Um, if it's going to be all leaders have a problem with you calling them out, nothing's ever going to change. If no one can say, hey, look, I noticed so-and-so and you know, that's, that's not really the way to approach it. If we can never do that, um, if we can never be authentic in that way, then you're not going to be able to build a climate of authenticity. <clears throat> Next slide. So since I've been in practice, I've definitely heard a lot of the pushback and challenges that um, authenticity and DEI, DEIB, it all gets. Um, one is from older companies. Ford is an older company, but there's tons of older companies out there. And they'll say, well, but this is the way we've always done it and it's worked. Um, or, you know, we don't have the systems to make that kind of change. Like we just got to operate within us. No, you don't. It's time to break the mold. I, I think in other areas of the business, we're comfortable with innovation and creativity and let's push forward. But in this area, people are like, mm, I don't know. That's not really the way we do things. So we have to be comfortable challenging that. <clears throat> There's lots of feelings of what about me and reverse discrimination from people who may be losing their privilege. Um, and one of the most important things for us to do as DEI practitioners is bring everyone along on the journey. So diversity does not mean underrepresented groups. Inclusion is not just about um, you know, one particular group. And I think we get kind of messed up about that because advertisements for diversity or like multicultural events don't feature everybody. They feature one type of person. And so we have to make sure we're intentional about including everyone and making them allies, um, making them advocates, bringing every, letting them lead the charge as well. Uh, for a company that sells cars, some people will say, what does this have to do with selling cars? 
And I think that we can easily point people to the well-established business case at this point. We know exactly what it has to do with it. We, we sell cars better when we're uh, our authentic selves at work. We have the space to create. We have the space to uh, reach new audiences once we're allowing those unique perspectives. So I think that's an easy one to sell people on, but you still get it. And then the metrics and measurement of change is all about accountability. It's all about knowing that we are actually doing something because organizations look the same for 20 years um, and it takes somebody to actually show you. And I mean, I know you think you're doing well because you have one woman on your team, but look, we haven't changed in 20 years and come along and push us forward with some of this uh, measurement. So how do we know if change is occurring is a good question that we have to try and answer. And then I thought I would bring some examples of some practices that <clears throat> companies have been doing to improve authenticity and also DEI and belonging. Employee resource groups have been mentioned several times. That's pretty common, as well as large scale events. Um, like I think companies that belong to the CEO Action Pledge of Diversity and Inclusion, they all are required to have a day of understanding. Some companies have like a women's summit or disability conference or, you know, however you want to do it. They have these big events. Um, but there's some more specific practices that I've really been looking out for. Um, so one is about growing leadership or employee competencies. So really equipping the employees with the ability to drive change. Um, I'll have some examples. So Spectrum Health developed the training programs for their physicians to directly address this behavior. Um, and that's one way to say this is not an HR problem. This is not like a, um, you know, throwaway thought of like, we should all be good. And the next day you're right back to your regular job. This is a way to go directly to the source and say, hey, we need you to do better. And this is how. Lots and lots of people have been having courageous conversations in different ways. I know Chevron has um, Mark dialogue groups. So there, it's called Men Advocating for Real Change. And it's the same group that gathers to talk every month and they have them throughout the companies. Um, Ford has a In the Living Room series where we bring different employees together and it looks like we're all talking in the living room, but we talk about a topic that's not usually something that's discussed publicly. Um, some of them are alternative view practices like uh, reverse mentoring where the, the CEO is mentored by a lower level leader that's of a different demographic group. Those can be kind of cool, as well as micro interventions. So Humu, for example, does, um, of course, now I can't think of what they're called, um, nudges. There we go. So nudges where you might get just a, a little ding, a little ping about, hey, maybe you want to check out this behavior or, hey, why don't you check out this thing that's happening? Um, little ways to intervene on our, in our behavior. I think Booz Allen also has like snapshot discussions that they use to increase feedback and that's become a more equitable process for them. And I think that's it. Yes, that's our presentation. Thank you all so much. That was really fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. The chat was on fire that whole time. Just people loving, loving everything y'all were talking about and sharing. Uh, let's take at least one question here and then we'll go to our last speaker and then we'll open it up for a broader discussion. Um, this one, I think probably a lot of people feel this. What are some methods for handling people who do not want to get do not want to be allies or get on board with the changes or shifts that are happening. I think this is coming up more and more where we organizations are facing employees with tenure who are high performing or who have no intention of changing. Do y'all have any thoughts on that one? So I'll give a quick what I think the data says answer and then I'll let Courtney talk about what actually happens to me in the workplace. So um, I have been reading a lot about the effectiveness of, of diversity practices. And by effectiveness, I mean a couple of researchers who tend to actually look at the numbers. And I, I so, so let's be careful here in that this is talking strictly about representation. And so we'd have to then see, as Dr. Wilson was saying, if this translated into inclusion. Um, 
But one of the things they talk a lot about are, are that if you don't have accountability measures in your workplace, so diversity committees or diversity managers that have some kind of power, um, then it's gonna be hard for things to change. So just like we have accountability in a company that has you know, safety training or things like that, we need to have accountability for diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. What that looks like for a company might depend on that company. So maybe Courtney, you can probably speak to that in a more tangible way, but that's what I would say from, from the literature would be, you know, no training is gonna fix things without any sort of accountability. Um, yeah, I think I, I would say the exact same thing is that you have to have those built-in accountability measures. So at board, we're currently, um, inputting them and we have what we call inclusive leadership competencies and so just being a leader part of being a leader is that you're expected to behave in these certain ways and so if you don't you can go I, I mean I'm speaking as Courtney and my unpopular opinion is that um, this is not a, a cheesy part of fit of like oh you have to be happy all the time this is no you literally have to treat people as equal human beings and if you don't then you can go. Um, I saw a question in the chat about retaliation, and we can save it for later, but um, I, I think it goes right in the same arena. Great, thank you. So we'll, we'll save the other questions here for a little bit later, but now let's hear from Dr. Ashley Bamberg. Thank you so much for hanging on and closing us out strong. We'll give you the floor and then we'll open it up more broadly. All right, hi everyone. Let me figure out how to share my screen. Um, you all see my PowerPoint there. I see Courtney nodding, so I think so. Um, I'll probably end up touching on a few things that Courtney touched on as well, um, and a lot of the other panelists too. Um, so my name is Ashley, and I'm just going to give maybe a brief background about me, um, and I'll discuss DEI in the role of IO psychology um, in promoting fairness at work from kind of two different lenses. Um, so first I'll discuss my PhD research, um, and then I'll discuss some of the ways IO psychology has been utilized to ensure DEI and fairness in relation to hiring at some of the companies that I've worked for. Um, so Courtney, I feel you on having your, um, having to defend soon. I actually defended last year in 2020, um, worst time to graduate, but I did it. Um, so I studied IO psychology in my undergrad at Colorado State University. Um, from there, I've always kind of had an interest in traveling the world. Uh, so I actually went and did my master's in organizational behavior um, from kind of a different perspective, not a psychology program, but um, a business school program at the University of Limerick's um, Kimmy Business School. Um, and then I stayed on and completed my PhD in what's called work and employment studies, basically IO, um, but graduated during the pandemic. So the majority of my background is academia at the moment, um, but I've now kind of come into the practitioner space as well. Have worked at JetBlue um, doing some people analytics and then have worked at Lumen um, now under talent acquisition. Um, so I'll kind of start off discussing my research as it relates to DEI and fairness at work. Um, through the age lens. Um, so I know some people have talked about, you know, um, disabilities and then um, other aspects of um, fairness and DEI. Um, my research has been focused on age. Um, so after my master's, I wasn't actually intending to do my PhD, um, but I ended up staying on um, because I was kind of searching for jobs at this point, um, along with a lot of my friends. And I started to notice that there was a lot of discussion surrounding generations um, and what each generation, you know, valued from organizations, what specific generations wanted, and kind of how to um, get specific generations to apply for certain jobs or to retain specific generations. 
Um, and so I'm sure you guys have kind of all heard this like conversation around generations and what each generation values at work. Um, conversations still exist today. Things like, you know, millennials prefer to work from home, um, but baby boomers are preferring to, you know, go back into the office and have hybrid workplaces, things like that. Um, so what I ended up doing was decided to research whether generations actually differed in what they valued at work and whether organizations should tailor policies and practices um, towards attracting and retaining specific generations. Um, there's a lot that I could get into on this, um, particularly in terms of, you know, how generations are defined. Um, and in short, generations are largely defined by age um, and specific age groups. Um, and those who share the same birth year or the same age are typically kind of grouped into a specific generation. Um, this is a very interesting topic in itself, as there is really no cohesion as to what a millennial consists of or what baby boomers consist of in terms of age or age groupings. Um, but in terms of this, my findings demonstrated no significant differences across age in what people value at work. Um, and kind of how it relates to this is that, firstly, regardless of age, it seems that people just want to work for an organization's, an organization that provides value. Um, and then on top of that, most importantly in relation to this talk, um, is that the use of a generational lens um, or these age groupings that have kind of no backing um, to explain differences at work or to attract or retain um, people at work seemingly just represents little more than age stereotyping. Um, and as we don't stereotype on any other group, uh, we shouldn't do that with age. Um, and it can introduce age bias or ageism in organizational decision-making. Um, so potentially only attracting millennials and only hiring millennials or looking to only hire younger people at work. Um, so that's just a bit about my background in terms of research. Um, but following that and following my PhD, um, I became interested in wanting to apply this understanding to ensure that hiring policies and practices are based on evidence um, to ensure fairness at work. Um, so from there, I'm going to kind of switch gears. I have worked um, at JetBlue for people analytics, um, particularly in the selection aspect of hiring. Um, and then also am now working at Lumen under talent acquisition um, and looking at um, selection processes and practices to ensure um, fairness at work. So I know a few of the panelists have already touched on this. I just wanted to kind of provide like a basic understanding of some things that I've done as an IO psychologist in the selection aspect um, for DEI. Um, there's many different things that are important. Um, I think Ludmia, you said it perfect when you said it's just important that organizations have valid selection procedures and processes in place um, to make sure that fairness is occurring um, in the hiring process. Um, so a few things that um, the companies that I've worked for has done to ensure fairness at work and fairness in hiring is using artificial intelligence to eliminate like human error or human biases in the hiring process. Um, and this is fairly in the beginning stages of the hiring process, just so um, there is no opportunity to make sure that um, there's no opportunity that not everyone has the chance to make it into the next stage of the hiring process or to the hiring interviews. Um, having assessments as part of the selection process. I know we kind of discussed how um, personality assessments can play a role. I think it's important to note here as well that companies shouldn't just use assessments as the sole decision maker in the hiring process. Um, assessments take place um, based off of a job analyses. So it has to be specific to the role as um, one of the panelists mentioned. And then it, it, can, it should be used in conjunction with other aspects um, of hiring, just to ensure that there's fairness throughout 
um, every bit of the process. Um, having diverse interview panels, having diverse leadership, I think Courtney, you mentioned that, um, making sure that diversity is represented in these hiring processes so that there's not just a one-sided view, there's not the opportunity to have bias, um, there's multiple people represented in the hiring interview panels so that there's not just one view on the candidate. Um, panels is a great thing to do as well, just so there's multiple people, not just one person interviewing someone else. Um, I think a few of the panelists have also mentioned competencies um, and competency-based interviews. As IO psychologists, um, we're well-versed in job analyses and making sure we understand a specific role, um, creating a job description and person specification based off of these job analyses. Um, and then these competencies are based off of what the job entails. So you're making selection decisions based off of what the job entails, um, rather than, you know, personal intrigue with a, a candidate or, you know, getting along with a candidate or asking candidates various questions um, throughout, you're asking all candidates the same questions based off of competencies um, that are required to perform in the role. So you're getting a true understanding of their behavior and that behavior that they can display for their future roles. Um, and then I know training isn't the end-all be-all, but it's really important that also not only are, are these practices carried out, but that the people carrying out these practices are trained on how to understand their unconscious bias, understand the importance of DEI in an organization, and understand the importance of conducting competency-based interviews and making sure that selection and hiring decisions are based off of these the understanding of these competencies and the person's ability to do the um, role required. So that's just kind of a broad overview on multiple things that these companies have incorporated as a part of, you know, ensuring fairness at work and ensuring fairness in the selection um, processes. And that is the end of my presentation. Like everyone else, you can reach me on LinkedIn as well. Thank you, Ashley. So thank you everyone so much. Um, I failed to give a really good intro at the beginning to say part of the purpose of this these webinars is just to give everyone exposure to the different types of careers you can have, the different types of training. We had a much more focused topic tonight that really got at these different aspects of DEI. And I think our panelists did an awesome job of covering that. So thank you so much. Um, so we have a few Q a few questions in the Q&A and, and we have about 13 minutes left. <laughs> so we will, panelists, if there's any you see in the Q&A that you wanna take, please speak up and do so. And if not, I'll kind of start to read them out. I'll take um, the one that's at the top because I tried to type it and then I accidentally hit backspace and it went away. So, <laughs> um, so this idea of focusing on DEI while also dealing with a labor shortage, like I just don't see it as a pie where you take pieces. It's you can do both. You can focus on DEI and focus on labor shortage. You're not losing anything to recruit from more diverse areas and for whatever that means, less diverse areas. All you're really trying to do is to reach a larger swath of qualified candidates because the most important part is, are they qualified? So doing targeted recruitment or having that as a goal does not preclude you hiring someone who's qualified or reducing the range of candidates. And then in terms of reevaluating hiring qualifications, I think any good organization is always looking at their qualifications and recruitment strategies based on talent management. What can I, what can our organization afford to develop? What do we need to buy in the marketplace? And really focusing on looking at, you know, applicant um, throughput. What are you seeing in terms of candidates? Are you seeing something systemic or a trend where you would want to make a change to 
qualifications or the hiring processes, one example, and then I'll stop so other people can talk, that I um, typically see is that in my previous organization, they had a computer skills test. And they had been using it for several years, but at the time we were evaluating it, I think in like 2014, the pass rate was like 99%. Because as we've moved forward, people are, you know, they can write their email, they may not be super skilled at the word suite, but they can, you know, move around the mouse on the computer. So that's no longer useful. So we took that out of the battery. So you should always be looking at those things to make sure that you're getting what you need. Great, thank you, Renee. Um, there's a follow-up question. Um, she says, Deborah says, Renata spoke about assessments. Are there specific psychometric tests or scales that you use to target? I'm not sure. You're on mute. Mm -hmm. You're back on mute. There you go. Oh. I'm sorry. There you go. I don't have a mouse. I'm using there you go. A touch pad. So I think um, Dr. Preslova brought up in the in the question and answer. You need to do a job analysis. There really is no go to assessment. It all depends on the you know the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you're looking for. Like when we're talking about things like personality, or do you do like a work sample? It really depends on what you're trying to. What's your goal? What are you trying to uh, measure here? And um, yeah, there's no go-to. I'll leave it at that so other people can talk. All right. And do any of the other panelists have um, any of these they say that you want to answer? I think I can answer, or at least start to answer Deborah's other question up there about workplace bullying, the power imbalance, and authenticity. Um, so so I, the question was just, is there research out there that connects this idea of the power imbalance, um, people who are denied psychological safety and um, authenticity, particularly um, historically excluded groups. And uh, what it made me think of is that some of the early research on identity management that wasn't, they didn't use the word authenticity, but um, on sexual orientation disclosure, looked at when people will and won't disclose. And one of the a couple of the early models discussed perceived discrimination as being a big um, predictor of whether or not you'll disclose in the workplace. So that kind of gets at not quite bullying, but the idea that you are looking at your environment. There's even this idea that uh, of signaling theory where people signal, right? They drop hints to see how people might react and then um, use those reactions to see how much they want to be real, right? How much they want to talk about their identity in the workplace. Um, and then the other thing it made me think about was um, some of those identity management models, uh, a big part of it is perceived costs and benefits. So in terms of power differentials, the cost and benefit can just not be in your favor and people will decide, I'm not gonna disclose. One of my early studies, I looked at um, depression disclosure in the workplace. And one of the um, study participants who wanted to speak to me afterwards to see, you know, why are you surveying me? So I, I kind of gave her the rundown of the study and she said, I work at a mental health organization, like an advocacy organization, and I still didn't feel like I could tell anyone until I got exactly the job I wanted to get. So until she got the power, and when she had the power, then she told people. And this was at a supportive organization, but when you don't have full job security, or, or at least you, you're not the level you want to get at, some people, you know, it's very personal weighing the costs and benefits of, of how you're going to discuss your identity or an actor identity in the workplace. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I can say about that in terms of some of the research I've seen. I just want to add that like everything that Jennifer and Courtney were talking about, I was like, oh, this is research. That's my life story. I can't, <laughs> um, you know, natural hair as well. Like the moment that I decided authenticity was most important that's when things kind of fell into place because of all of those things that they were talking about in your research, feeling comfortable enough to be yourself, feeling the pressures to assimilate into a certain organizational culture. And the worst part is the other people, because I worked mostly with IOs, them not realizing that they're creating a culture that's exclusionary 
because they're not in touch with those ideas in a way that's um, bigger than research or bigger than, hey, I consult on these things. And it was a, a very um, homogenous environment. So I totally, I, I was like, ooh, that's, that's me. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm, I'm at the point where I can do it if I want, or I'm going to do it regardless. So this is for me. It's definitely been well, a lot of me search. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah, for sure. One of the other questions that was posed that I, I typed a quick answer to, but it was asking about, you know, what do we do if we're a new person or if we see something unethical or do we speak up? And, and one, the way I answered it was we really just have to decide where our values lie. And do I actually want this job if I can't be me or if I can't, um, or if I have to put up with unethical behavior or if I can't. And, you know, sometimes we do have to make a decision that's so hard and we don't have another great option to go to. Um, but one of the things I, I like about what Renee just said is I just decided I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. And um, I know not everyone's in a position where they can do that, but if we could all work toward that together, that's really great. And when you have that privilege to recognize it and, you know, as Courtney was saying, sort of allow other people to be authentic around you. Um, and sometimes it is paradigm shifting. Courtney and I, I think when we were discussing something earlier, I think Courtney, this is you and I talking about what you were saying about the learning culture and, and making mistakes. And I think that's something that I see that's moving maybe in the wrong direction recently because people are very nervous about discussing DEI topics and we're moving away from people people are freaking out they might make a mistake and I think the better frame of mind is I'm going to make a mistake and then what am I going to do about it um and that's also being authentic uh because you know no one can be authentic if you decided you can never make a mistake even around something as important as issues of identity at least that's what I think <laughs> people are very afraid of cancel culture like they don't want to be canceled and and who among us wants to be called a bad human being I think that's nobody I um, think when, like, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say kind of a subflight of what Jennifer was just mentioning is that, like, when you have decided to be authentic, then you allow others to be authentic. And I think a lot of the issues is that everyone in some way is being inauthentic at work. And you're, it's, you know, it's the whole system. So you're upholding the status quo by holding the line for other people because you're not you don't feel free, so why should this person feel or be free? So I think the more, like you guys were saying in your research, if you start with yourself, then that's kind of like the change that helps to move the organization forward because you'll then allow other people to the grace that they need. Yeah. I was just going to tap into the question that asks about working in industry and getting a PhD simultaneously. Um, my graduate school advisors were not happy about it. They were like, don't do it. <laughs> they want you to stay and finish your dissertation because um, I had not even proposed my dissertation when I went to Ford in 2019. Um, but for that, I would say count on whoever your guidance is, your personal spiritual preferences, if you have any, just take the time to contemplate and, and, and consult with that because miraculously, I took the job and then a pandemic hit. So it was like the best decision I could have made, but I wouldn't have known that, you know, if I had been listening to everyone else but myself. But I'm saying all that to say I have a very, very supportive team that let me work like six months part-time. Um, they let me take off days when I'm like, oh, you know, my defense is coming up. This just happened last week where I was like, I just need this one day. And my boss is like, yeah, go ahead. Who cares? So it's a very supportive team. It's autonomous work. So they are supporting this effort with me. So it's important to find a place that will support you that way. There are a few other questions coming up about training and programs and things like that. And 
Um, rest assured, we will. We have covered many of these topics in the past three webinars, so I'll be sharing that link with everyone where you can go watch those. But then we also will share, and I feel like maybe we need to have some of these guests back again to talk about some of the um, career and grad school questions that are coming up now too. You know, how do we get to this? How did we all get to this point? So um, I think if you have specific questions and you've um, resonated with any of the panelists, please reach out directly and ask them because we're all willing to talk about our experience and our opinion about things and, and when we have it, the data and the research that support certain things too. So um, any other closing thoughts for anyone on the panel? Anyone want to say anything? Okay, let me, sh oh, go ahead, Ludmilla, yes. Oh, I, I saw several questions and uh, chat indicators that people are just struggling personally, either with a manager that is in the way or a lack of power. And those are horrible situations to be in. And uh, I think everyone here probably can think of uh, just personal situations. I mean, I was literally told Old by manager at one point, you're not a human because you're not an American. So on the day when my father died. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, things happen in the workplace. So just don't let it break you. Just let it fuel you. It's hard. It's horrible. Try to find your tribe. And there are more people who will understand than you think at the, at the moment. And they don't have to be necessarily 100% matching all of your intersectionalities, but there are people who experience similar things and dealt with them. And uh, uh, just keep talking to the right people and just keep turning it into, okay, I'm just going to make the world better for other people. That's great. Good word. <laughs> so if you, um, so everyone who's here, I imagine you registered because you got the Zoom link. So you will get an email from me with the link with the recording. And at that point, if you want to respond or want to be connected to any of these speakers, I'm happy to do that as well. If you haven't been able to get in touch in a different way. So if you didn't get your question answered, I'm really sorry. I'm so glad for all the great content we got tonight and the discussion we did get to have. So Thank you again, everyone. And everyone have a good evening. Thanks for organizing, Sarah. Thank yes, you. Yes, happy to do it. Thank you for being a part. Bye, everyone.